But I, I was really pleased to get this because um, I'm old enough that I lived through the bioinformatic revolution, and we learned things uh, from that. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, I worked with a, a mathematician, Jim Cornett, who, who used to come over to uh, the newly hired molecular biologists and try to engage us in collaborations. And we simply said, you know, we don't, we don't frankly need any computing. The band is either on the gel or the band is not there. You know, within five or six years, we were inundated with data and we needed to do extraordinary uh, computing. It looked like extraordinarily complex computing at the time. But I think there's a lot we can learn from the, the sociology of what happened during the introduction of bioinformatics to biology uh, as, we, as we look at the phenotyping era. So I am going to talk about predictive uh, phenomics of plants. I want to begin with um, the agricultural challenges. Most of these you're all aware of. I mean, the, the various bullet points here, you, you all know those. But I want to go through the figures. Um, this first plot in the upper left is um, a plot of grain yield, corn grain yield over time. And I've, I've simplified uh, multiple regressions here with this red line that I've overlaid on here. But starting up until the 1930s, corn yield didn't go up at all. It wasn't that people weren't trying, but they didn't have appropriate field plot design, so statistics. Uh, they didn't have access to technologies which made this inflection point happen, like uh, hybrid corn. And since the 1930s, yields have gone up almost in a linear fashion. But it, it's not truly, uh, it's, it's only happening because there are multiple regressions under, hiding underneath this curve, which are, represent the introductions of new technologies. Uh, we've got double cross hybrids, three-way hybrids, single cross hybrids, molecular markers, transgenes, uh, genomic selection uh, most recently, and uh, high throughput phenotyping, I suspect, will uh, be important at the other end here. So that's good news. Um, bad news is over on this side, which plots in inflation-adjusted dollars private sector R&D in plant breeding. Again, we have time on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have this, again, inflation-adjusted R&D, and you can see that's going up. So this is not a case of things costing more due to inflation it's getting harder and harder to make the same amount of genetic gain each year. Now, despite that, the plant breeders and the agronomists have been tremendously successful, and I'll just illustrate that with this uh, plot or a figure in the middle here. So these are grain elevators. When the farmers harvest their corn, they bring it, and it's, it's placed, the corn is put in these uh, silos, uh, cement cylinders, and then it's offloaded onto trains, which are behind here. You can't see them, which take them to the Mississippi barges and distribute them around the world. In a good year, though, there's not enough room, and the corn just gets piled up in the, on the ground there. To give you a sense of scale, that's my wife and, and younger son, who are you know, normal height. So it works, but there are these challenges of uh, diminishing returns. We've harvested the low-hanging fruit. And then there's this aspect of climate change. This book is an exceedingly uh, depressing book. It's, it's also very, very well written. I haven't finished it yet. I'm saving it. I, I use it on those days at night uh, when I get home and it's been a terrible day. I read this depressing book and it places my own small problems in perspective. And I can realize that even though I have my problems, the world has much worse problems. Uh, but I, I recommend it. Um, and you know, the thing is not simply the world's getting drier and we're getting temperature extremes. It's increased weather variability. And our agricultural systems were developed over the last 10,000 years, which was a period of extraordinary stability when we look at on a geological scale. And our crops simply are not adapted to dealing with weather variability. So a major focus of my lab is to how to translate genomic data into both biological understanding and crop improvement. Uh, we were part of the team that sequenced the uh, maize genome uh, a long time ago, back in 2009. Um, and since then, public databases have accumulated vast amounts of DNA sequence data for this species, available to anybody in the world who wants to use it. But the challenge is, how do we use those data to make these advances here? And there are a number of ways. But one approach, and the one I'm going to focus on today, is to use these massive amounts of genotyping data in combination with large phenotyping data sets and environmental data in a big data paradigm to develop statistical models that enable us to reasonably accurately predict traits in the field. So if we are successful as a community at doing this, we will be able to increase the rate of genetic gain per year, so help 
deal with keeping that curve moving in the right direction. We should be able to breed crops to withstand the increasing weather variability. Uh, and leading, because we'll be able to provide farmers with evidence-based recommendations of what to grow when and how to manage those crops, we should be able to lead uh, to both increased yields and probably much more importantly, enhanced yield stability. So what's necessary to achieve this goal? Well, first we need enhanced understanding of the influences of genotype, environment, and the genotype by environment interaction on phenotype. I'm not going to talk very much about that. We need appropriate phenotyping technologies that can be deployed in fields. We'll talk a fair bit about that. And we need appropriate algorithms for extracting features, just as Mitch said, uh, from images and other kinds of uh, phenotyping data sets, and then analyzing the resulting uh, trait data. So there are a number of approaches to phenotyping that I've uh, tried to illustrate in this uh, simple plot here. Um, we, can, we can do phenotyping in controlled environments, and the significant advantage of that is we take environment out of the equation. So um, no, there used to be an equation up here. So phenotype is a function of genotype, environment, and that interaction of genotype by environment. And if we uh, grow plants in a growth chamber or some kinds of uh, highly controlled uh, greenhouses, we simply can look at the effect of genotype on phenotype in that specific environment. The disadvantage of that, of course, is plants generally don't spend their lives in greenhouses. They live out in fields. And so we really do need to understand the influences of environment and the much more complicated interaction between genotype and environment. So both of these, though, have roles. We also have uh, at least two scientific approaches to tackle this. One is the hypothesis-driven research approach, which is the, the favorite of biologists. We were all trained this way. This was drilled into us as graduate students that this is the only way to do science, actually. Uh, that's not correct. And I'm going to make the pitch probably not news to most of the people in this room, but it is sometimes a hard sell to biologists that data-driven approaches can actually lead to, to great advances in our understanding. So just a reminder that weather varies not only from location to location within a year, but also from year to year at the same location. This is uh, drought data. And that we can learn a great deal by studying this variation and conducting our experiments out in the field where the environment changes from place to place and year to year. So if we take a number of environments and uh, sort them by the amount of stress that they are experiencing, and we define that simply as the average yield of a series of hybrids, we can see that different hybrids will perform differently across these environments. This is the genotype by environment interaction. So the average hybrid, by definition, will have higher yields here under the low stress environments and lower yields under the low stress environments. But the slope can vary. So this red line would represent a hybrid that uh, would be quite popular in the, the Midwest, where farmers can, to a certain extent, control the environment. They can apply fertilizer and water. They can control pests. So they're, they're willing to give up stability for terrible. They also have um, crop uh, insurance. This also contributes substantially to this uh, decision that they make. But they want to get the maximum yield they can under the best environment where a subsistence farmer who uh, crop failure means uh, hunger is not willing to take uh, that risk and would rather have something more flat, give up the upscale to protect from the, from the downside. But we do not understand the genetics of this difference in slope among these hybrids. And that's really something we, we need to understand in a, in a world with increased weather variability. So to get at those questions, um, with colleagues, including Natalia de Leon at uh, University of Wisconsin, who's my co-lead on this, we established the Genomes to Fields Initiative. And this is a public sector effort to collect data from a, a set of lines that have been genotyped and grown in multiple environments under standardized conditions, data collected using SOPs. So we're collecting data from all of these uh, locations across the US. This is, to my knowledge, the first uh, data set like this that's been available in the, to the public. So it's an extraordinary resource. But most of the phenotyping that's been done on those uh, plots to date has been traditional phenotyping. Uh, as Mitch said, yardsticks and calipers and, and combines at the end of the season to get yield. So we'd, but we'd like to uh, move forward with, with uh, newer, more appropriate uh, 
phenotyping systems, and I want to go through some design considerations for what would be appropriate in terms of phenotyping technologies. We would really like to be able to phenotype plants at multiple time points during growth and development, not simply at an end point. So this would allow us um, to look at dynamic traits, such as the rate of development and plant responses to the environment. We need to be able to phenotype multiple entries in multiple environments if we want to uh, tease apart the contributions of E and uh, genotype by environment. So our conclusion was we need scalable phenotyping systems that will allow us to collect multiple measurements per season and in, in each of multiple locations. So there are a lot of different phenotyping platforms out there uh, with different strengths and weaknesses. Um, there are a number of field-based systems with large fixed sensor uh, infrastructure such as gantries and rail systems that certainly have their place, but they're not going to help us solve the questions that I've been uh, discussing so far. We can't move these things, and they're also extremely expensive, so we can't deploy them at hundreds, ideally, of sites around the, the world. There are, of course, uh, sensors mounted on uh, field-deployed uh, robots uh, and UAVs or drones, and then I'll also talk about uh, inexpensive stationary field-based sensors. So let me begin with um, this Phenobot. So this is a USDA-funded project. Uh, Lee Tong, an ag engineer, and Maria Salas, uh, a sorghum breeder, uh, are my co-PIs on this. This looks like a garden tractor, but it's actually a robot because it has a GPS and an auto steer unit, and it has a number of sensors on the front. So it's fully autonomous. We've outfitted it with a number of different kinds of sensors, but what you see here is uh, they are pairs of reasonably high-end consumer-grade cameras that have been adapted to detect in the near-infrared. So we can generate stereo images uh, from these cameras. And then using the data that come from that, we can reconstruct in point clouds the 3D structure of these plants. And of course, we can do this over time because the robot can drive through the field however often we want to do that. We can then compare the trait data that we extract from those point clouds to manually measured uh, trait data. For example, uh, plant height, stock diameter, and leaf angle. Now I have to say that there is still some manual intervention here. This is not a completely automated process. That's what we need to do. We don't have that yet. But in this semi-automated extraction, uh, data extraction process from the stereo images, you can see we're getting excellent correlations with physically manual, uh, manually measured traits. I want to turn now to, so that the robot might be able to go through the field uh, once a day if we're really pushing things. But many things that happen in a plant are on a much shorter time scale. And so a robot simply can't go through a field every 10 minutes. So there, there is a technology for this. It's called time-lapse photography. And it's, this is not a new thing. This is a, a, a video from 1933. So I, it was posted on YouTube. I hadn't realized that uh, YouTube was around so long ago. But they, they do have this one. So I guess they started uh, earlier. I'm sometimes a little slow picking up these new technologies. But oh, there's sound here, too. Maybe you can hear this. It's worth listening. Skin has been removed from this it doesn't matter. It doesn't. You'll find it on YouTube. There's a beautiful soundtrack and a narration. But the point is, by taking pictures frequently, and I don't know what the, the interval here was, they are able to watch plants res develop and respond to the environment. So here, uh, they're, according to the narration, these two roots are actually interacting. And there's, according to the narration, kind of a fight going on. And this guy loses. I'm not sure that's what's happening. It may be that that root is actually hitting that rock there and taking off. This, though, even though it's been around for a long time, is not a high-throughput approach. For high-throughput, we need new technology. And so uh, this is my son, James Schnabel, who's an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska. And he built this prototype high-throughput uh, time-lapse photography technology. So, uh, here you see a Raspberry Pi computer, $25, $30, uh, connected to a, a very inexpensive cell phone camera. And on board, there's an SD memory card as well as a Wi-Fi uh, system. So we can either collect images on the SD card or send the data to the server 
which in this prototype was sitting inside of our kitchen across the sidewalk there. Um, now, so what this can do is you can program the Raspberry Pi to take a picture, say, every 10 minutes, which is what James did. Now, in any collaboration, it's absolutely essential that both parties contribute. You understand that, right? I mean, this is a fundamental of collaboration. So my contribution was to build the wooden <laughs> adapter that connected the prototype <laughs> to the tripod, because James had been using duct tape, and that offended me. Um, and, and you'll see some data from this prototype. Since, since in the next slide, but it, since then, uh, Srikant Sernavesan, uh, who's here at uh, the meeting, but in another session uh, this morning, uh, has, uh, with others in my team, developed this into a, uh, a more robust system and then also um, deployed um, systems in the field so that we can collect, uh, you'll see in a few minutes, what he's done. So this is, uh, these are some data from James. And so this is uh, a series of genotypes still in a greenhouse, we'll be in a field in the next slide, uh, a greenhouse, multiple genotypes that are being drought stressed. And what I want you to do is watch the leaves, the lower leaves on the right hand side here initially. And you know, if, if we forget to water, if a graduate student, uh, a former graduate student forgets to water the greenhouse on the weekend, uh, when we come in on Monday, the plants will be wilted. But we don't typically have the patience to sit there and watch the wilting. But if you watch what's going on here, watch these leaves on the left, okay? And then over on the right now, same thing. So I've shown this video all over the planet and nobody, no biologist has ever come up to me and said, oh, I knew that's what was going on. The other thing, so we're seeing stuff by compressing time with this time-lapse photography. Uh, we're also seeing that there are differences in genotypes at the rate at which this wilting is taking place. So that there was a plant here, uh, which uh, what it is doesn't matter, but it is genetically different than the other plants. And if we wait long enough, it will also be wilted. But if we watch the process, we can actually see genetic differences in the rate. All right. So um, based on how well this worked in a greenhouse, we went ahead and scaled up in 2015 to do this in the field. So this is a plot with 5,000 different genotypes, each of which has 13 million SNPs um, scored on it. We have the genotypes here. We didn't have electricity in this field, so we needed to use solar panels. Uh, we're collecting this with a, a drone. Um, okay, so here we've gotten a little bit more expensive cameras. These are sort of low-end, consumer-grade cameras in almost waterproof uh, boxes. Uh, the Raspberry Pis in those boxes, along with batteries that are charged by the solar panel weather stations so that we can uh, connect whatever's going on with the, the weather. We can watch plants going through their growth and development, the vegetative stage. But we were particularly interested in looking at what happens at the reproductive stage. So um, pollen production, this is anthesis, uh, is not limiting in hybrid fields, but uh, in production of hybrids, crossing two inbred parents, to, this is what the seed companies do. Uh, sometimes pollen production is limited. So this pollen is used, the plants, uh, these male plants uh, produce pollen, which then fertilizes so-called female plants uh, to produce the hybrid seed that is sold by farmer, to farmers. But there's sort of a dogma about the progression of anthesis. But what we've discovered by looking at this and watching these is there's great vari variation among genotypes in the progression of uh, anthesis. And we can then, because we have many genotypes and we've got these genotypes well characterized by uh, SNP typing, we can identify chromosomal regions and ultimately genes that control this variation in this development, important developmental process. Of course, that generates uh, vast amounts of data. Um, this was from the 2015 plot. Uh, we had uh, 700,000 images uh, being generated per month and uh, five or six terabytes of data being generated every month. And it simply isn't possible to, uh, I at least can't convince my graduate students to look through that many photographs by hand and try to score them. Now, I don't think this is going to be a surprise. This comes back to Mitch's point about feature extraction uh, to this audience, but among biologists, uh, these things have spoiled us, and the, the, the standard uh, response to a problem like this is, well, just left, so you know, we've got all these images. How do we identify the tassel, right, this male structure here, distinguish it from everything else in the picture, and then be able to characterize what's going on in the tassel? 
And as I say, the, 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 the iPhones have spoiled uh, biologists. And the response is, well, just let the computer do it. And so what I have learned is that computers are very good at doing what we learn in school. They're much less, uh, 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 it's, it's less easy to uh, ask them to do what we learn uh, when we're still in diapers, when we're recognizing mom's face versus dad's face versus something else. But we collaborate with Baskar Longa's last name in the ISU phone directory, um, whose uh, team has, has used this bag of features approach to recognize tassels. And we'll be hearing a talk uh, later on this morning from a member of his team about how they've done that. And it's been extraordinarily uh, useful to us. Uh, and we expect uh, to be calling on him a great deal as we go forward. This was work from one of his undergraduate students who helped us uh, calculate leaf angle over time from this greenhouse experiment and was able to plot how the leaf angle changes from each image in each of the various videos. Now I want to go through um, uh, another short story here uh, using UAVs. So we're not, uh, this was the UAV we used last summer, 2015. We're not looking, we're not using UAVs to study plot level changes in fields. Instead, we are looking at individual plants or individual rows. So we are much lower down. We're not very high. Um, and as with these light UAVs, wind is a problem. And so you have to do a lot of uh, image uh, reconstruction to, to get what you want out of here. And with regulations that existed last year, 2015, you needed a couple of people out there, one staring at the robot and the other one uh, authorized to actually steer it. But we did finally get some very useful data from this, even though I was quite skeptical at first. So um, Teng is a, uh, one of my graduate students, wa was at that time, a graduate student at my lab at China Agriculture University. And she came over for the summer last year to, uh, to help us with this. And so this is, this is what she found. Uh, she was looking at a set of 380 inbreds, each of which had been uh, extensively genotyped. And we also have uh, expression data on all of those lines. And she looked at each of those lines from above with the UAV and found this pattern that uh, some of the genotypes, the axes of the plants in the row were, to use the scientific term, higgly-piggly, mm -hmm. while others were coordinated, much like a uh, crystal lattice structure of some kind of packing. And this puzzled us, because if you, if you plant a seed, the uh, embryo is on a particular face of the seed, and, and the orientation of that seed will define the orientation of the plant, at least initially when it uh, germinates. But what this suggested to us was that plants were actually responding to each other. I mean, the seeds were randomly planted, so this couldn't happen by chance. So the plants must be adjusting themselves to their neighbors in some interesting way. Now that's important, because if we go back to this yield plot that I, I showed at the beginning of the presentation, We've been looking at yield increasing steadily every year. All of that yield, all of it, well, let me say it this way, a different way. None of it is due to an increase in per plant yield. Per plant yields have not gone up at all since the mid-30s. The, in, the yield increase is all due to increased plant density. So breeders have been able to breed plants that can tolerate living in San Francisco rather than living in Ames, Iowa. They, plants which can tolerate crowding and still produce yield. But again, the per plant yield hasn't gone up. So this is quite interesting to us, because maybe this is part of the process that breeders have inadvertently uh, exploited to increase plant density and hence drive yield increases since the 1930s. So we set up a, a greenhouse experiment once we had these uh, data and uh, to ask uh, about this plant rotation. So, so let's just watch this plant here and watch what it does for a little while, and then we'll, we'll move on. So it's, it's elaborating new leaves. And then these leaves actually, in fact, do uh, rotate around, uh, sometimes quite dramatically. So we can just watch a little bit longer here. And what we found is that there are differences among genotypes in how they rotate. So some genotypes rotate just a little bit. Some rotate quite a bit. So we set up a follow-up experiment. Well, let me, let me back up first. So what Ting did is she took these uh, 380 lines and she classified them on a scale about how much they did this uh, plants-aligned phenotype. 
And then she did a GWAS, a genome-wide association. So this is a way of identifying which chromosomal regions are associated with differences in this uh, behavior, this rotation and, and alignment. And she found a number of hits, one of which is expressed in the shudipical meristem, which is um, the structure in a plant which elaborates the leaves and would necessarily be involved in any kind of a rotational process. And this gene is involved in um, auxin signal transduction. This is a plant hormone that is known to affect what goes on in the shoot meristem. So it's early days. I'm not, uh, this is, uh, we can certainly make a, a story about how this gene might be involved in plant leaf rotation, but we need a lot of additional work. So um, this summer, we set up an experiment now designed specifically to look at this question of rotation. So we have plants here, and instead of looking at plants sideways or using a UAV, we've got um, these cameras, these stationary cameras driven by Raspberry Pis, looking down at plants, taking pictures every 10 minutes so we can watch them rotate or not. And they're planted at different densities so we can ask whether or not that rotation is also uh, influenced <coughs> by neighbors. So we're both studying the behavior of the individual plants over time and trying to get epigenetic control of that, because this is a, a diversity panel that we have genotyped, and also asking how these behaviors are influenced by neighboring plants. And ultimately, we'll be interested in how that also is influenced by the environment. So this is an example of beginning with a data-driven approach in the field, going into a controlled environment and doing some hypothesis testing, and then moving back to the field for additional hypothesis testing. And again, this point I want to make is that the field experiments and the controlled environments are synergistic. So controlled um, environment experiments really are synergistic with these field-based experiments. This is a, an NSF-funded, um, um, it's not a device, uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a series of growth chambers. Uh, Steve Howell and Steve Whittem are the PIs on this. So a series of growth chambers in which you can independently control the environment. So let's say you find a, a gene, an allele of a gene that seems to be responsive to temperature in the field based on a data-driven approach. You can then test that by, you know, having rooms with one degree temperature changes. And then this is uh, called the rover, where this is a device with sensors that, uh, it's a robot, that can move from room to room collecting information from the plants. This is being built by uh, and deployed by Li Tang, who you saw earlier. So I want to um, summarize uh, and, and discuss some future directions. So it, it's, it's really critical, uh, truly critical, not for those of us in this room, but for several billion people on the planet who don't have the resources that we have, that we develop new crop varieties that exhibit uh, yield stability in spite of an environment that is uh, experiencing increasingly uh, variable weather. To meet this challenge uh, is going to be really hard. This is tough. Um, we're not, as a species, we're not used to thinking in longer scales. I don't know how the Egyptians did the pyramids. We certainly don't have the social structures to do that kind of stuff right now, long-term, big projects, um, unless we're involved in wars. Um, so to make this work, we, we absolutely have to convince uh, governments and industry to make bigger, uh, longer-term investments in sensors, robots, and algorithm development. We need to collect data from lots of coordinated multi-year sites where we actually think through what we want to do and, and use SOPs and organize data and have uh, data repositories that will stick around for long enough so that as the algorithms uh, advance, we still have the raw data so we can reanalyze existing data. And there's room for both hypothesis-driven and data-driven uh, approaches here. We also need to engage uh, a diverse uh, community of scientists with very uh, disparate skills. And this is exactly what happened in the bioinformatics era. It was necessary to pull new people into the field in order to accomplish what we wanted to do. So we certainly need the plant scientists, engineers, computational scientists. And we need, just as we did in the bioinformatics era, we need to start training the next generation at the intersection of these areas. So I just wanted to put a pitch in for this training grant that we've been awarded from NSF uh, with exactly that goal. Um, our first group of students arrived uh, last week, and uh, I met with them. Uh, they seem like a a really interesting bunch. This is clearly not something for your average graduate student. They need to be able to move across these disciplines. It's going to be quite a challenge. But if you have undergraduates uh, in your labs that are interested in this kind of a challenge, I do hope you encourage them to check out our website and consider uh, exploring this opportunity. 
And then finally, uh, I would thank our funding sources. Uh, we're funded by the uh, National Science Foundation, the USDA, <coughs> the NIH. Uh, I'm funded uh, in an endowed chair by the Iowa Corn Growers. Uh, this is my team in China and my team at uh, Iowa State in Ames. I would be very happy to answer questions. The, the level that, so the question is uh, whether we can use satellite uh, information. And at this point, I haven't thought of how to do it. Our plots are actually fairly small. We're growing just uh, one to a few plants per genotype. Um, but if you have ideas on how that would be useful, I think uh, genomes to fields that will begin to get useful as you look at what's going on in individual genomes to fields yield plots, you could perhaps um, uh, adjust. Um, phenotypic data by what's going on in the neighboring fields, you might be able to do some smoothing to reduce some variability. Yes? So, it's sort of a computer science question. It seems like if you've got, you know, two sources of error in this data, how do you know to trust the data that you're, you're getting out? And, and what are your plans as that scales, right? I mean, if you've got 100 cameras, you might be able to look at it. If you've got a million cameras, you're going to have to have some way to understand the difference between what the science is telling you and, and what the device is yeah, um, there's, a, there's a lot there. Um, um, give, me, give me the first question again. How do you trust the data? Trust the data. So that, that was one of the things I really worried about. This plants aligned thing. So Ting and maybe Srikanth first came to me with these pictures and said some rows are higgly piggly and some are aligned. And I said, you know, this may have to do with just random planting variation, right? But the fact that she could find signals in GWAS convinces us that there really are, uh, there's some significant pattern there that we can trust. Of course, we're doing follow-up experiments. So the best evidence that it's not noise is that you can find patterns that are repeatable or associated with other uh, patterns that you know are true. The second uh, question, or second part of your question about scalability is huge. I mean, that's really why I was so glad to come here. Uh, there is a sea change going on in biology. We need help, and so the more people we can get involved, the better. I would also put a question out to you. I've been asked by some of our collaborators in Genomes to Fields you know, where can he deposit the raw UAV data so that everybody in the world can start accessing it? I've asked NSF, I haven't got an answer. Because what I said was that astronomers must have figured this out already, but uh, I have, my program manager is still uh, looking. So if you guys have ideas, we'd love to do that so that others can use it and mine it. I have a question about Phenobot. Uh, how do you uh, get the uh, cloud point data? Do you use LIDAR? Um, on the, the software was mentioned on there, but it's not my expertise. This was a graduate student in Lee Tongs. Maybe uh, we can uh, slide back there and you can take a look at this. Yeah, here. So he was using Patch Match. Okay. Which okay. He, found, he tried a lot of different things, but that worked well. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, apparently, the main driver of this, the problem of getting more yield, is water stress. Can you track back how much water stress can impact the production? Yeah, so the, the question was, or the, the comment was that much of the, the challenge of generating increased yields is water stress. And, and actually, in some environments that is true, but in other environments, water is not limiting. So there are people who can irrigate and, uh, you know, if you drive, if you fly over the Midwest, those green circles, right, I mean, this is a center pivot irrigation. Uh, until regulation controls how much water you pull out of the aquifer, like here in California, deep, deeply needed, uh, that's, not, that's not a huge issue. So water is not the only limiter, but it is an important one, and it, it's an increasingly important one. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Leong Dong at Iowa State, is building uh, small sensors and implantable sensors that will ultimately cost a few dollars a peach that will measure things like nitrate in the stock or moisture right on the the interface of the leaf and the, the atmosphere. So again, we need to collect the data and ask how different genotypes interact with drought stress and how drought stress over different time points in the developmental cycle affect yield. So there's a lot of room for further study. Thanks for a really great talk. And I was intrigued by one of your comments where you said the plant productivity hasn't changed, it's just the density. So in that context, I wanted you to comment on precision agriculture which has increased yield twice to thrice in many cases, right? That's what Sunny Ramaswamy, NIFA director, says. So how do you reconcile the two, and, and what are other ways to increase yield? So um, 
One of the things that is being discussed intensively, farmers in the, the Midwest, uh, US Midwest, have invested a huge amount of money in agriculture machinery. What we know now is we probably ought to be planting differently. We ought to be planting hexagonally rather than in rows with greater density within row than between rows. We should probably, at least for genotypes that don't behave uh, with this plants aligned phenotype, we should probably position seeds exactly how we want. And my understanding, though I haven't reviewed the primary literature on this, is that in fact that does increase yields. So there will be opportunities to do that. But we're going to have to engage with the, uh, the companies that make the, uh, the agricultural equipment. And right now they're all broke and laying people off. So that's unlikely that they're going to start investing in new stuff. Thank you. I, I thought the, the data driven you know, discoveries, I thought that was really intriguing. So am I right that you know in the past I guess that just wasn't possible because you can you cannot collect you know uh, a lot of amount of data with, without a particular uh, specific purpose right um, now but the the discovery that you did you did with the rotational patterns that still took uh, a very well informed scientist to look through the massive amount of data I wonder if what your thoughts may be on even partially automating that sort of discovery process, is that uh, infeasible or take the fun out of the scientists? Yeah. So um, is it desirable? Absolutely. Is it feasible? I, I hope so, but I, I turn to your expertise to, to help me understand whether that's true. Um, I will say that uh, there wasn't a biologist who found the pattern. So it was a, an electrical engineer and a first year graduate student who doesn't, has never looked at plants before last summer found the pattern and came to me and said, is this interesting? And then, of course, I had to say, yeah, that's actually maybe really interesting. So maybe there's hope. <laughs> OK. You mentioned about the raw data. You s one possibility you could do next year's uh, KDD, you could have a KDD cup competition. That data could be analyzed by 1,000 groups. I think that would be a great idea if, if you can uh, inform me about how to get onto that kind of a program and where we could post the data, uh, I think that's a fabulous idea. In one of your early, earlier slides, you showed the yield curve. Uh, 1930, it was flat, and then it just started taking off. Uh, two questions there. How much is the growth? I mean, I, I was trying to squint and read the slide. It seemed like there was a factor of four improvement or maybe more. Yeah. And then the second question is, given that the curve doesn't seem to be showing a sign of slowing down, even though the cost is high, what, what are your expectations for how far could it go with, with big data or without big data? Yeah, OK. Uh, those are good questions. So the, the, um, the improvement is a couple percent a year. I don't think it's fourfold since the 1930s, but it's, it's uh, maybe three times something on that. I've got a slide that actually compares grain crops. Corn is the best of all of these, um, but they've all done this. The worst is doubled. Um, and then there is a big debate about whether there's a plateauing going on. Um, it's pretty clear that the only reason, if we don't have a plateau, the only reason is because more money has been, been, the companies have thrown money into corn research. The large seed companies compete mainly on corn. That's where most of their R&D dollars go, and there are interesting economic reasons for why that's the case. With the price of corn being low, the amount of layoffs that we're seeing in the industry, the consolidation that we're seeing in the seed industry, I think it's probably likely that we may actually see um, some of this, because investment may very well go down as a industry-wide. But my question is, just in case you keep on putting more and more resources, what's, I mean, if you're going to be feeding the world with 50% more food requirement, and hopefully with less stress on the land, yep. what, do, what, what can we what expect we from the yield? What, well, what can we expect from the yield? OK, I, I think I understand your question now. So that is not the physiological limit. It's not like we've approached the physiologic limit. Um, Farmer, there's a, a yield contest, much like the, the KDD contest you were uh, suggesting for analyzing data. Farmers also have contests where they try to maximize yield. And there's no limit to what you can do to the, what sort of inputs you can provide. So you can, you, know, you can have drip irrigation, and you can carefully give just the right number of drops of water and the fertilizer, and you don't have a single weed in the field, and it's the best soil, and so forth. Um, they far exceed what our average yields are, even what the best yields in commercial fields are. So, there are still substantial room in the physiology, physiology of the plant to increase yields. And that's not even considering what changes we can make genetically. So there's still lots of opportunities. But we do need uh, to use the, the tools of big data um, and high throughput phenotyping if we're going to make that work, I think. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, you talked about the 
uh, quantity of data you had coming in. Uh, well, just curious, what technology and stack you guys use to store and analyze and query that data? Um, so, uh, Srikant Srinivasan, who I mentioned was here, and you saw his photograph, he asked me if I needed him to be here in the session, and I said, okay. only if I get a question like that. Got it. So, um, if you want to, you can send me an email, and I'll put you in touch with him if you can't find sure. him in the program or in the, the attendee list. Great. Um, but awesome. you, you need people who know how to do that, and I'm not one of them, but you definitely need that on your team. Yeah, that's my day-to-day, -day, so I was just curious. Good. That sounded yeah. like a fun problem. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a question about what kind of technologies they use for precision irrigation? Precision irrigation, maybe we'll talk about that more this afternoon, I guess, when we get into water. Um, but there's a lot of opportunity, center, especially with the center pivot irrigation. I mean, you can be sensing the plants in advance of the pivot, and so the pivot goes around spraying water, right? If, if there are sensors ahead of the pivot in real time analyzing, you could calibrate the amount of water that's provided based on what you think the plants need. So I think there are, and of course, with high value crops like almonds here in California, you can really think about how you could better calibrate the amount of water you use. Um, so there's a lot of room for management uh, control. Okay, thank Thanks you. Let much. me join me in uh, thanking him one last time uh, for what a great talk. <laughs>